Welcome to the Underground Paradox, the UGP. After a short stint investigating on the Yorkshire Moors, I'm back here on my home turf in Devon, England. I'm lucky. Over the last few years, I've been able to research and investigate both Dartmoor National Park in Devon and also Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, the county right next door. Although I've been investigating this area for quite some years, I'm only now starting to log and record it on video and share it with you guys. So please make sure you subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. And they're, they're walking, they're coming. And I see the top of the head. The top of what head? The top of whoever's coming through there. What did, what did you see? What it looked like to me was just, uh, it was dark and I could see it bobbing every time it went. So, I mean, I knew it wasn't a deer. It was dark. Um, I can't say that I noticed that it was a, a really a cone-shaped head at the time. Um, but, I mean, I definitely noticed that later. For centuries, the Dartmoor folklore and legends have encompassed tales of ghosts, witchcraft, weird happenings, and a host of deep-seated beliefs. These have been passed down through the generations via fireside stories, books, and local tradition, all of which have played their part in keeping the tales alive today. Since the 1950s, Dartmoor National Park and the coastline of Devon have been a UFO hotspot and a cryptid hotspot. There is no question that Dartmoor and its landscape has helped fire people's beliefs and imagination. From the thick mists that suddenly appear and roll across the moor to the dark bottomless mires and the craggy granite tors, each lends an air of mystery and magic, all ripe for associated legends and tales. For this episode, we have a wealth of locations, tales and encounters, all which relate to various strange events which took place somewhere on the Dartmoor landscape. Hi guys, and uh, welcome to Dartmoor. Hope you enjoyed that intro and a little bit of an overview of Dartmoor. I've just pulled up at the side of the road um, just to talk a little bit about what I'm hoping to investigate in today's episode, uh, just to whet your appetite. Um, the first location I'm at right now, I'll, I'll talk to you about in just a moment. Um, but after we leave here, I'm going to try and take you guys to a couple of locations where, um, if you're familiar with uh, Deborah Hatwell's uh, cryptid map of the United Kingdom, um, there's a couple of locations right near where I am now uh, where there's been reports, both of hairy men wild men and also ape-like creatures. Um, some of them, you know, decades ago. Uh, so, if, for example, one location I'm going to take you to uh, very interestingly was reported in 1967, which is the same year as the Patterson-Gimlin footage, funnily enough. Um, but then there was another sighting that's near Dartmoor Prison, uh, which we've discussed on a live stream, um, previously on the Monty Zone, and uh, that was um, that took place in 2016, so pretty recent. So th this map covers reports that are right up to current day, um, and also over the over the years as well. Um, so that's two locations, and I want to go and investigate them because, as I said, you know, one of them we've talked about on a live stream, but um, you know, it's. Uh, it, I always say if you're going to truly investigate, you need to get into the location, you need to get into the environment and it's going to be interesting to see what I can see uh, by going to that location and share it with you guys. 
Um, then I'm also hoping if time allows and weather conditions allow today, uh, I want to take you to one of my locations that's a favourite Skywatch location. Um, now I know that this channel, The Underground Paradox, is all brand new and um, I'm starting now to share with you some of my investigations and locations that I research here on both Dartmoor and Bodmin Moor which is in the county of Cornwall. Right now I'm in the county of Devon. Both are on my doorstep uh, so I'm very very lucky. Um, but I've been researching and investigating and visiting these areas for years but now I'm going to start video documenting it and sharing it with you guys and hopefully you're going to enjoy it. So I'm going to take you to a location where I do sky watching. It's one of my favourite locations. However, I go to that location both during the day and the night to sky watch because unlike a lot of investigators, um, I believe uh, that, you know, viewing and investigating during the day is just um, as exciting as during the night time. Um, you know, most of like really good evidence in ufology and, you know, videos and, and photos and witness accounts happen during the day. Um, it's like I was recently discussing with um, a friend about how, you know, to break down this idea that to, to find something unexplained or thought provoking or paranormal, you don't need to go out into the wilderness. It can happen anywhere. Um, you know, there's a, a recent video that Justin from Mountain Beast Mysteries has uploaded all about, you know, sightings that he's had uh, in the sky. And that was right on the balcony of his apartment in the middle of a city in Canada. So, you know, you don't need to do what I've done today and come out into these real wilderness areas. But, you know, it certainly helps um, getting fresh air. Uh, and I love sharing this with you guys. So, um, where I am right now, uh, and the reason why I'm talking to you right now in the car, is because you, you'll have seen uh, on the drive-in that one of the big, if, you, if you've never visited Dartmoor, one of the things you need to know about Dartmoor is that there's some really big, expansive, open areas where there's tours, hill ranges, and, you know, even on the best day, it's really windy up here, and the conditions are are um you know can be quite treacherous um you know i mentioned in the intro there that you know the the national park of dartmoor is one of the national parks in the uk that is responsible for the most deaths some of them obviously have you know clear explanations um but not all of them do and this is going across the centuries back into history as well but one of the biggest dangers of dartmoor is the unpredictable weather uh, and that has accounted for a lot of tragedies and deaths here on the moors and you know the weather can change like that like a snap of a finger i've joked around with people before about uh, how the mist up here is very similar or the fog i should say very similar to um you know san francisco where it can just roll in at no warning whatsoever and it's one of the biggest things that leads to people getting confused and lost and you know uh, losing their trace of steps and you know just getting into really dangerous situations so you really need to know if you're going to go off the beaten track and you're going to go away from those tourist things and I'm sure you could see from the drive in right there I'm lucky I've got a four by four um, so it allows me to get to some areas of Dartmoor where it's a little bit off the beaten track um, but you need to know what you're doing because it is treacherous out here and once I go out to where our first location is and what I'm hoping to share with you, um, it's going to be very hard to do any um, voice to camera because the wind will just take over. But hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll still be able to uh, negotiate around that situation. So right now, we're at a place called Child's Tomb. Um, and it's not a tomb of a child, so please don't worry. Uh, child is spelled C-H-I-L-D-E. And it is the name of um, the Lord of the Manor. Uh, several centuries ago, uh, there was an incident with um, the Lord Child who lived in this area and obviously was Lord of the Manor.
but let's get out and let's start seeing what we can see and really enjoying this wilderness and this national park of Dartmoor. See you in a minute. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention just a moment ago, and hopefully you can hear me okay, I've got my mic up, uh, but sometimes that doesn't help. Um, but one of the things that I didn't mention, and uh, whether you believe in global warming or not, um, the weather here in the UK started quite well in summer. Uh, we had some really nice hot weather throughout most of May and the first part of June, and then from mid sort of late June, and right now it's the middle of July and um, the weather has just been awful. Grey, wet, cold, very, very unseasonal. And yesterday there was a really big storm and uh, in a few hours in the morning, I, I, I reckon there was about at least three inches of rain. You can see the weather right now in the background and um, it's about... I would say 14 degrees right here where I am, but with wind chill, probably feels more like 10 or 11. And, um, you know, it may start raining soon, as you can see, and I may have to take shelter. Um, but these are the kind of weather conditions that I'm talking about. It, it, it's always very, very uh, unpredictable on Dartmoor. And, um, you know, it can just change, as I said, in the blink of an eye and you can find yourself in quite a, a, a dangerous situation. And right now I can see right off into the distance, right over back there to, uh, you know, uh, it's not a tour, but certainly some elevated land. And, uh, you know, I could be stood here for 10 minutes and all of a sudden uh, a mist and a fog comes rolling in and just totally, uh, you know, encapsulates this area. And it's, a, it's always a kind of low-level fog as well. So you can understand, you know, you've probably seen it in the movies, the Hound and the Baskervilles, and movies that sort of feature Dartmoor, and you always see that kind of mist and, and um, fog and, and, and grey feeling. But, you know, the sun is out periodically today. Um, but, you know, again, that those weather conditions just give Dartmoor this kind of crazy eerie feeling most of the time which really fits in with a lot of the legend and myth and paranormal and mysterious uh, events that have happened here over the centuries and makes it a very very interesting area especially as a paranormal investigator to explore um, but right now as I said we're uh, I'm continuing to walk and look for this child's tomb I've never actually visited this location so it's a first for me and it's a first for you so uh, hopefully we can get something or find it and uh, see what we see what we see so the wind is definitely picking up and uh, so again sorry about that but I just wanted to take this moment just to you know we talk about wilderness a lot and um, you know a lot of people are very doubtful in the UK about certain phenomena because you know the UK is just a, a small island in a lot of, in comparison to a lot of other countries but that's not to say that you can't get that sense of wilderness and there aren't locations where you really get away um, from what we what we deem as human civilization I mean just where I am now uh, and I'm just going to do like a complete 360. I cannot see a single building and I cannot see a single living person. Plenty of sheep, um, but nothing around. Uh, just open skies, open land, lots and lots of wind. And um, I'm still continuing to look for this tomb. Um, I need to, need to really focus on it now because I am not having any luck so far. I've just come across this area um, I just thought I'd quickly get it on camera because there's no signposts around or anything but this definitely looks like sort of structures um, you can clearly see you know what look like 
rooms and yeah but there's no information about it um, around so uh, maybe it was uh, a little town or, or a village previously or maybe it was something more related to like a mill or um, something like that but uh, yeah no information about but you can clearly see that it looks like this was uh, a habitable area at some point. I'm having no joy finding this tomb as I said to you guys um, I wanted it to be a first for me and a first for you um, so what I'm going to do is um, just behind me there there's some elevation I'm going to head up there to see if I can get a better view uh, of this area um, because I know I've seen photographs of it so I know what it looks like but I just can't seem to find it so undeniably this was some sort of building at some point and served the purpose looks like a fireplace there so if you guys can see that but yeah definitely looks like there would have been a chimney there so uh, maybe farmers uh, little village or uh, but again I'll have to see if I can find any information about it but there's certainly no, nothing here in the in the area to explain what the history is behind this but it's really interesting another one there uh, definitely can clear, see clearly the outline of buildings but as I mentioned I'm just going to try and make my way up to this elevation and see if I can get a better view of the area and uh, locate this tomb that we're looking for Right, so the wind is getting seriously bad. As I said, I, I'm making some elevation and uh, it's even getting hard to see. Eyes watering and everything. Um, but here's just another example. This one's fenced off because this one's uh, particularly dangerous. But an old mine shaft. And just to give you an example, I don't want to lose my camera by it falling out of my hand or something stupid, but. Uh, yeah, it goes down quite deep and uh, thankfully they've put a fence and barbed wire around this one. Primarily for the sheep and cows around here because they don't want them dying, but also it helps us humans as well. Um, yeah, got a little bit more elevation to do just yet. So I've almost finished the elevation, it's uh, taking quite a bit out of me doing so. Uh, but whilst I was making my way up the hill, a thought just occurred to me, as often does when you're out and about like this but I was saying about how I don't think that you always need to sky watch at night and I've seen some really like even recent compelling evidence of craft and unidentified uh, flying objects or aerial phenomenon depending on what you want to use but you know the main message that I just wanted to get on camera is you know if you're interested in this subject especially like ufology Make sure now and then when you're out during the day that you're looking up into the sky because uh, a lot of people forget to look up and there could be a lot going on that you might see and you might be able to capture and don't always think that you're going to see everything at night time. Um, I've been trying to scour these skies because again I personally um, on any of my ventures onto the moors even though it's a UFO hotspot I haven't seen any phenomena. Uh, that's not to say that I haven't had my own experiences in my lifetime and you'll find out much more about them um, in the future but um, or about that I should say not them so when you have one experience but I've certainly not had any sightings out here on the moors but I continue to look and uh, you know it's always well worth looking up during the day because uh, you never know what you might see So I definitely wasn't expecting this when I got up to the top of the hill. Uh, some random 
what looks like quite a deep uh, stream, uh, which is very, very full of water. Um, and again, that's probably related to the storm yesterday. And oh my God, the wind is just getting crazy. I'm gonna get blown into the river in a minute. Uh, I think there's a little stone bridge down there that I can still make my way across. There's a little bit more elevation. I am kind of hoping that the tomb is at the top of here. Now the catch-22 situation that I find myself in is I did have, um, I did have coordinates uh, for this tomb, but I'm right out deep in the middle of the moors with no signal whatsoever. So I now can't use those coordinates to bring it up on the map to guide me. Uh, so what I'm going to do, if I'm not successful today in finding this tomb, uh, I will come back and I will have the coordinates already pre-saved um, and come in to this location with it on my map. Right, it's got to that point where I'm seeing the mist coming in, fog, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can sort of see it all around the area. It's just starting to come in, especially on the low level ground at the bottom of the valley there. Um, and it also feels like it's going to start um, raining at any moment now. And it looks like these ominous clouds that it's going to be heavy rain as well. So I'm going to make a move, abandon this search for today, move on to the next location. Dan, I've just stopped to uh, get this one on camera. I don't think this happened in the storm yesterday. It doesn't. I mean, it looks fairly fresh, but not as fresh as yesterday. Um, but, you know, again, just a really good indication of how strong the winds get out here. Um, it does seem like this happened pretty recently and has taken the whole tree down. Um, but one thing I haven't mentioned thus far, and almost came across it, across it, sorry, myself, just a moment ago. You can be walking out here, there's quite marshy in Dartmoor as well, there's a lot of areas where it's very, very marshy and with conditions like it was yesterday with so much rainfall, there's certain areas where I've been out with friends before and you could be walking along and all of a sudden just someone disappears and they fall right into the ground into a marsh area that just almost happened to me. And again, that's another thing that you have to be super mindful of and can cause accident or injury or even worse sometimes. So I know I'm making it sound like as if Dartmoor is uh, some sort of crazy, dangerous um, location and, and I don't want to put people off visiting. Um, but, you know, if you do go off the beaten track, if you do go away from tourist destinations, it is an area like any area of wilderness anywhere in the world. It needs respect and it needs um, you to have your common sense and wits about it. Um, hopefully you're picking all of this up because the wind um, is just getting crazy and uh, I'm going to have to make my way back to my vehicle soon. Just getting a bit scared of this weather. Okay, so I've taken some shelter underneath this tree for a little bit. Um, this is a weird area. So I keep thinking that I'm seeing things. Um, now I did see something earlier, which was a bit om ominous looking, but it turned out to be a l rather large, uh, bit, big black ox. Um, but it sort of came over the hill in the distance and looked like, you know, the hand of the basketball or something. Uh, really, really black. Um, so that was explainable, but I keep thinking I see movement out of the corner of my eyes. Um, about 15 minutes ago, I thought there was another person in the area. Um, but, you know, once I sort of turned that direction, it, it goes, it went. So uh, maybe just sort of me seeing things or pareidolia or whatnot. But the reason why I've stopped here is because I don't want to see this as a fail that I've not found the, the tomb because I don't like to think in terms of failures. And it means that I can come out here on another day with the exact... GPS coordinates and find this location. 
when you see the picture which I'm going to share with you of this tomb, you'll understand why I thought it was going to be something that I would easily find. Um, but I have a sneaky suspicion, and the reason why I've stopped here is because most of the time that I've been spent here, I've been sort of filming, you know, the, the valley and into the distance. And I'm just going to sort of uh, turn the camera around quickly. And I think that it's off in the distance there. Um, as I was driving in, the coordinates on my map were saying that it was in this direction here. And uh, I don't know, I'll just get underneath this tree so you can see it. There looks like uh, sort of, it's not a path, but where some vehicles have obviously driven through the, the landscape there. And I think that this tomb's over that hill. And it's a very reachable distance, but given that I want to get to some other locations today, I haven't got the time to walk all the way over there and walk back in the hope that it is somewhere in that location. I'd rather come back with the exact GPS coordinates and be able to, you know, definitely know that I'm heading in the right location because that there and back is probably a good two miles walk. So for now, I'm going to get back to the car and we're going to start heading to one of those locations that have come from the Deborah Hatwell uh, cryptid map and some recent sightings. I'm going to start with the the oldest one, which was 1967, and hopefully it's in a location where it's not as windy as it is here. Let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. But let's get back to the car. Back at the vehicle, and the rain is just kicking in, and so is that mist and fog. Uh, doesn't come out really well on the camera, but all over there in the distance you can see the fog rolling in. So uh, just a really good, another good example of just how the weather can just turn on you all of a sudden in this location and does quite frequently. So on the drive from location one going to location two, I swear to God, I thought I'd been caught in some sort of portal to another dimension or to another year in the past. I thought I'd been transported to 1960s, 1970s United Kingdom. This coach that was in front of me, I think was probably older than I am. And it was a wonder to see, but very strange at the same time. Right, here I am at the second location and unlike the schoolboy era of the first location today, I had my GPS coordinates for this location ready. This is the first of two locations that I wanted to take you to where there's been sightings of hairy men, wild men and ape men like creatures. Uh, let's check out some narration and just a quick insert of the story behind this location and the sighting. Bob Shenton saw something bloody odd on the wilds of Dartmoor back in the winter of 1967. He was driving across the moors late one night. At the time he worked as a plumber and he was heading to a house to deal with a case of a burst water pipe. And while near the village of Postbridge, he came across something decidedly strange, according to Bob, for the very briefest of moments. And as he approached Postbridge, he caught sight of what looked, for all the world, like a large ape-like figure crossing the road in front of him and vanishing into the shadows at the edge of the road. He described this creature as shadow-like. It just went into the trees and was gone. Those were the details of this sighting that took place in 1967. Very ironic that that was in the same year as the famous uh, Patterson Gimlin footage that was taken in the States. Um, I don't think, you know, a lot of people will instantly jump to, well, maybe the gentleman, uh, Bob, was influenced by the, the story that he saw in the news uh, that took place in the States. But given what technology was like in those days, no internet, no email, uh, only things like newspapers and 
probably even before the days of faxes. So I would imagine that the story of the sighting by Gimlin and Patterson in the uh, States took quite a while to circulate um, in, in and around news channels in the States and probably didn't make its way over here to the UK until sometime after. So it's very unlikely that that gentleman was influenced um, by it's just sort of a coincidence, I think, that this took place 56 years ago in 1967. Um, so, but what's really, really interesting and I haven't showed you yet is that this location, and I've just been showing you the road because the gentleman was driving home late one night uh, when he saw this uh, ape-type creature, but this is where we're at. So, I don't know if you see this, but this is called uh, Susan's Forest. It's a very scary forest. I have been here before, um, but not alone. And um, for the purpose of visiting this location, I'm gonna take a bit of an explore into, let me just turn the camera around a minute. I'm gonna take an explore into this uh, woodland forest. Um, as I said, I've been here before, um, but in the company of others, never by myself. It is a very creepy, spooky location and quite a big forest as well. Um, so let's go and have a bit of adventure in here and see if we can find anything interesting and I'll take some footage. I'm walking around I just um, had another thought which I wanted to share with you guys um, because having you know been interested you know quite deeply in the um, Sasquatch Bigfoot phenomenon for you know the last four years or so and then you know this emerging uh, phenomenon of dogmen I was just thinking about it the other day what I find really interesting is that and it's not unique, but in the majority of sightings, encounters of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, primarily um, the creature comes across as quite benign. Uh, either it wants to just get away uh, and remain hidden. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that there aren't cases of, um, you know, and I've certainly covered them on the, the story time episodes that I do, on my other channel, The Vault, uh, where there's been some gruesome, you know, encounters and stories of Sasquatch and, and, and Bigfoot. However, you know, when it comes to dogmen, it's kind of the opposite. Like, it's the, it's the majority of dogmen sightings and encounters that people talk about this thing that it's very sort of threatening and pursuing them. And, uh, you know, that there's a lot of fear uh, and everything involved. And I was just starting to think because a good friend of mine, Ben, from the 401 Files, we talk a lot about, you know, Bigfoot here in the UK and other cryptids and the possibility of thinking beyond the normal logical, physical, biological and into things like other dimensions and possibly, you know, UFO connection uh, and otherworldly connection. But I was just thinking if it's entities or creatures that we're seeing, from another plane of dimension or, or reality, you know, maybe some of it is down to the individual's perception. So if you're somebody who doesn't naturally carry a lot of fear in these locations, maybe what you see is a Bigfoot or something that's ape-like or human, very much more human-like. Whereas if you instantly are in that environment and have a lot of trepidation and fear, maybe what you then translate in terms of what you see is, sorry, I know I'm not talking very well here, that's because I'm just about to drown in a marsh area, which I'm trying to negotiate my way around, but maybe what you see is, is then dogmen, um, you know, and, and something that's a little bit more predatory um, because of your natural heightened fear. 
I've just never heard anybody talk about that or, or make that connection. Um, so I just thought that that was quite interesting. And again, that's what I love about getting out like this because just being in these sort of locations, environments makes you start to think and um, you know consider different possibilities. I've got no evidence to back that up, of course, but it is, uh, you know, it can be documented though that, you know, the majority of, of Bigfoot and Sasquatch sightings are kind of benign in nature and lead more towards a creature that just wants to remain hidden and off the human radar. Whereas, you know, in contrast, a lot of the dogman uh, encounters and sightings, um, you know, have perpetual kind of fear behind them and almost like the creature was predatory and, and people were fearing for their lives. So, um, you know, just an interesting thought for you to guys to think about. Let me know in comments what you think. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay, because in um, typical technology fashion, my microphone has died on me. Um, so using the microphone on the phone. Um, but while I'm walking around this forest looking for evidence and keeping my eyes open for disturbances, possible tracks, um, and or possibly even, you know, the uh, golden nugget of seeing something move or seeing something physical, I just thought I'd take this opportunity to chat to you a little bit about what you guys can expect from the underground paradox in the near future uh, and, and what we're going to be doing. So uh, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm on in Devon right now, the county of Devon in the UK on Dartmoor, the national park. Um, but also I live like right on the, the cusp of the county of Cornwall as well and Bodmin Moor. And both locations are, are, are steeped in lots of myth and legend and are both a UFO hotspots and both have a great deal of paranormal activity in many, many locations, which here in the UK are the most reputedly haunted locations. Um, so there's gonna be plenty for me to investigate and take you guys out and show you this part of the world as well. So please do subscribe to this channel, give us all the support that you can and give this video a like and please share it because you know, one of the things that I definitely want to do is build this this community of like-minded people who can talk openly um, about all of these kind of subjects that surround the paranormal, uh, whether it be cryptids, ufology, um, ancient civilization theory, um, ancient advanced civilization theory, I should say, or things like ghosts and, and, and hauntings. Um, in this description to this video will be an email where you can contact me and share any of your stories or experiences, or maybe if you live locally in the location of the UK or Devon and Cornwall, and you've got some suggestions of things that you think I should go out and investigate and share with, with the guys, then um, you know please contact me and use that email um, to reach out uh, or, and, or just say hello. But thank you for the support so far. And, uh, yeah, just keep uh, keep checking out what's going to be coming. But so far in uh, Susan's Forest, I've not come across anything that really um, stands out as um, interesting. But I haven't finished my explore, so I'll come back in a bit if I if I find something. Just thought I'd stop and film this quickly. Um, if you saw the part two of my investigations with the 401 files that I did with Ben in the Yorkshire Moors, um, you'll have seen that I did a bit of a section about upturned trees and the pareidolia that can be associated with the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon. Just goes to show you how big I'm just looking now. And I don't know if you can see just how big this forest is. It just goes way off into the distance. If you look down that uh, sort of column of trees there, it's just endless. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, you can see this upturned tree right near me. And I don't know if you can see there's one in the distance that is starting to look like a little bit like a dark figure right off in the distance, but it is another upturned tree. 
maybe the camera doesn't show it as well as I can see it with my human eye. Um, but yeah, this forest is, is just saturated with these upturned trees. Um, so again, uh, if you were out here at night time, you know, you could mistakenly uh, identify these shapes as something different than what they actually are. playing tricks with me. I thought I was filming for a little while so I can see if it can be. I mean again, something that I've not mentioned thus far, but Dartmoor and so the Bobbin Moor. Very, very famous hotspot for big cat sightings. Um, so even if I wasn't to come across some sort of hairy man or wild man in these locations, then is it me? I just thought I just saw something. Right, I'm approaching the area where I thought I saw movement. I know I can clearly see that there's something that's obviously flat on the ground. Maybe that's a tree that's fallen. But uh, I just want to get a bit closer. Um, it's worthwhile at this point mentioning that I haven't seen a single soul since I've been in this forest. Now I'm going to freeze this playback right here. Because I don't know if you guys see what I'm seeing. And I'm not going to explain too much about it yet. What I'm going to do is just play back some of this footage now. But zoomed in a little bit closer. Take a careful look. Now you may agree or disagree with me here, but obviously as I'm editing this footage, I notice what looked like almost white figures appearing from in between the trees and disappearing. And there's an obvious explanation for this. Uh, it's the sun on the tree trunks that's uh, going in and out uh, due to the cloudy weather. And it's casting this sunshine on the tree trunk that appears and disappears. However, it would explain why I thought I saw movement um, because as you can clearly see on the playback, it does look like people moving in and out between the trees uh, and that's what drew my attention to this area. But as always, in comments, let me know what you think because that's my explanation for it but I didn't actually notice this at the time when I was there on location filming. Let me know if you see anything different. Right, so I've got to the location where I saw the movement. It was primarily behind this tree. Um, there's a stick randomly, which, you know, that's not odd. It could have just fallen off a tree and fallen that way. There's one on the floor. Um, can't see any disturbance. And the disturbance on here would be really, really obvious because, for example, if I put my foot into there, and I'm not a very big guy, but, you know, you can see straight away at these impressions. Look at that guy over there. Sort of stubby little tree with something coming off of it. Again, a dark night. That could look like completely something different than what it is. And that's where pareidolia comes into play. Just 
would look like a dogman, right? If you just saw the black silhouette of that. Or maybe uh, do a little bit of play around and uh, take a snapshot and do a bit of editing to show you what it would look like if it was all blacked out. Right, so nothing found in that location where I thought I saw some movement. But again, you know, if you've ever come out into locations and done this sort of thing, you'd understand what I'm about to say is that, you know, you have to be really mindful that your eyes can play tricks on you. Um, but you can not afford to ignore those tricks um, because, you know, one time in a million or a thousand or a hundred thousand, it could turn out to be something and you wouldn't want to miss that opportunity. It's a shame I just missed that moment. Just caught the tail end of it. It was really interesting seeing the sun appear. There we go sort of on the floor and then it sort of disappears where clouds are covering the sun it creates a really interesting effect across the forest floor again could be one of those things that often plays tricks on the mind the eye uh, and creates pareidolia because uh, it kind of almost when it happens it looks like the forest floor is kind of moving all this movement but yeah Something really, I've been in a lot of forests, um, both here in the UK and around the world. And um, this one's not particularly given me the fear as of yet, or given me, put, put me on edge, uh, which sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's a good edge that I get when I'm often out in forests etc. Um, two seconds, I'm just going to turn the camera. Yeah, so uh, it's that kind of adrenaline that, you know, is an enjoyable adrenaline. And obviously, I wouldn't do this and other people wouldn't do this sort of similar thing if you didn't enjoy it. Um, but you, you know, I, I've mentioned in the past as well that I may be a very mild sensitive uh, and pick up on sort of energies and stuff at times and you know there's a lot of locations especially forests and woods that I go to and you know you, you feel a sense of energy and I'm not getting that from this location thus far but maybe that's because a lot of my attention has had to be on being able to negotiate my way around it because of how wet and marsh-like it is and that it wouldn't usually be like this i know it wouldn't it was just extremely heavy rainfall yesterday in that storm and uh so it's making it slightly a little bit more difficult to you know orientate my way around and maybe i'm giving more focus on that than focusing in on the location um but yeah other than thinking i saw a little bit of movement which i've just completely and utterly investigated uh that's that's the most of what I've seen at the moment. So I'm gonna start making my way back, do the uh, sort of long walk out of this forest back to the vehicle, and take you guys to the second sort of Wildman Bigfoot location, which is uh, just outside of a town called Prince Town. But I'll tell you more about it when we get there. So here are my conclusions of location two, where this report took place in 1967. Firstly, I've got to say that I wasn't there in 1967, so I certainly can't say that it definitely wasn't what Bob Shenton said he saw. However, visiting the location, a lot of the topography will have changed over the 56 years, but I don't think the road that I showed you earlier would have changed. But there's a bank on the side of this road that leads into the forest. Now, whether the tree line of the forest was where it is right now in 1967. But here's another explanation. I've mentioned that Dartmoor is popular for big cat sightings, but also wild dogs. And 
you know, Bob Shelton, if he drove past that sort of creature going up the bank as he passed it, it could have looked like it was bipedal uh, because it would have had to put his front legs up the bank first and could have looked, looked much taller than what it was. But that's still quite an out there theory. There is another explanation and my time spent in Susan's forest, as I mentioned, there's a lot of upturned trees, there's a lot of things that look like shapes and maybe there was an upturned tree at the edge of the forest and as Bob Shelton drove past it, it looked like something different than it was and a hairy creature. Who knows? But let me know again in comments what you thought of Bob Shelton's report from 1967. Let's get to location three. Now the report for the next encounter which took place in 2016 is really really detailed and really really long. So I'm not going to go through it all. What I will do is put it all in the description uh, if I can so anybody that's interested could read it. Uh, but basically in 2016 an email was sent from a gentleman whose brother was in prison. Uh, he was housed in Dartmoor jail and his cell looked out onto the B3357 road that was close to the prison itself and has a small wooded area adjacent to it. Dartmoor still has a misplaced reputation of being a high security prison when in actual reality it's merely a category C prison. Dartmoor houses mainly non-violent offenders and white collar criminals. Now the gentleman goes on to say that he went to visit his brother in prison, he seemed unsettled, not himself, he thought he was possibly being harassed or bullied by another inmate, but it turned out it was something to do with something he had seen the night previous. He had been on day release and come back into the prison, back to his cell and was looking out of his cell window uh, at the woodland tree line and uh, he saw a person or what he thought was possibly an escaped convict or inmate. Uh, that was possibly picking up a, a parcel uh, of smuggled goods or, or something like that and he was laughing to himself thinking how is he going to get back in but just as that was happening the moon uh, hit this creature or this thing and he could clearly see that it was a muscle bound uh, hairy thing bipedal creature and uh, it really kind of freaked him out a bit Okay, so I'm here at the second location. I have to be quite quick filming here because as you can see, I'm not in a wilderness location. I'm right in the middle or on the outskirts of a town called Princetown, which probably has a uh, population of about 500. Startmore Prison sits right in the middle of Princetown. I am on the GPS coordinates where this encounter took place. And the one thing that's always bothered me about it is that apparently the creature that was described more like a hairy man and a wild man was spotted from an inmate and from his cell and um, one thing that's always bothered me is I know that the walls are quite high around the prison so how on earth um, as you saw from the drive-in there are, is some wooded areas and you can see behind me uh, that it, it, it goes into wooded areas and there's also some in front of me uh, slightly uh, some some tree areas but nothing significant and you know even from here let me just turn the camera around a moment so this is the sort of main part of uh, the prison and you know you can see some of the windows etc there but to be able to see a hairy man from that location out to here just doesn't really add up to me and that's why i've always wanted to come out and visit this location so um as I said, it's, uh, it's an official report uh, from 2016 that is on the Deborah Hatwell Cryptid UK map, um, but it's not something at the moment. Uh, maybe the location's just wrong, I don't know, um, but it's not something that I'm buying into at the moment, because as you can see, this wall that runs along the outside of the prison is, is quite high, and it's, not the, it's just the very outside wall. There's loads of inner walls as well, uh, a very secure location, obviously, because it's a prison. Um, but yeah, bit of a strange one. So sorry the visit to Location Free was so short, but obviously it's quite difficult being stood outside a prison uh, with a camera filming, recording, pointing the camera at things. Um, I didn't want to stay there too long because I would have 
uh, probably attracted some undesirable attention. Um, but also just being at the location, I knew straight away something's not right and doesn't add up. And I'm going to go back to the report and see if I can work out the location myself. But don't forget, you can see the full report as well in the description to this video. Um, and from this point onwards in my investigations on Dartmoor, my day didn't get any better. Uh, when I arrived at location 4, which was my favourite Skywatch area, my microphone didn't work, even though I thought it was, and so there's no audio. However, luckily, I was using my GoPro, and I had my microphone on my GoPro, so if the audio from that is good enough, you're going to see it right now. So it's got this natural kind of um, ledge to it, so it's really great for sitting on. Uh, you don't need to bring a chair with you, but I've got some friends with me who, because it, it's a dip out of the wind, because it's always windy up here on, on Dartmoor, um, and this gives a natural shelter, it's like a ditch, uh, let me stand back a little bit, don't want to spook these, these Dartmoor ponies too much, but they're obviously trying to get out of the wind as well, because it's extremely windy up here, um, but as I say, it gives a little bit of a natural ditch, location so you can kind of get out the wind it's good for doing filming and talking to camera even in the most windiest conditions like it is today but here's the thing um, and, and what I love about this location so let's just walk up to the top of the wind and sit down looking lighter on the floor there let's uh get it that um, yeah, so we can get on back up into the flat. Here straight away how windy it is up here. But this is what I love about this location because although it's quite close to the road, so it's not ideal for filming during the day, but during the night you don't get really any traffic around through here. But you get this great almost 360 view of the skyline on a clear day or a clear night. You can see so much of the sky. Over there in the distance is uh, Susan's Forest where we were just at, just the edges of it. We sort of, uh, go all the way past that sort of little tour there. Um, you can just see it dipping over the landscape there. But in terms of skyline around here and just being able to see so much, I mean, you're looking... Um, don't know how much the camera is picking up. Don't know if you can see the aerial mass right in that hillside in the distance. Um, but um, you know, you can see, as I say, for roughly about anywhere between sort of eight to ten miles in the distance. Orientation. So a great place to see as much skyline as you possibly can. So if you saw something, you could then really skyline so great location but as you can see it's extremely windy but if you come down here where I like to sit sometimes and you still see a good amount of the sky you kind of straight away come out of the wind it's awesome uh, and uh, yeah it's it, you know because one of the things that I don't like it is just wind constantly blowing on me and uh, this is a location of Dartmoor where you know it's very very rare you come up here and it would be calm and not windy just because of the nature of the environment and just uh, how nothing stops that breeze and, and here on Dartmoor it's, it's quite a significant elevation as well so again that's why it's uh, it's not very close to sea level so you get a lot of high winds up here but anyway so this is my location it, it's near a uh, location called Two Bridges uh, you have to drive through through two bridges, which is just, um, it's not even a, a town or a place, there's just a, an inn and a restaurant there, um, and, and then you get to here, and it's a great, um, it's a great view, as I said, of just, you know, the, the total uh, distance of being able to see around the landscape of Dartmoor, and certainly, and more importantly, uh, just a huge expanse of skyline that you can see, so great for, for, for sky watching. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed this first episode and investigation on Dartmoor. Uh, I will be back for more episodes and more investigations on Dartmoor, so please join me. And as I said earlier, please subscribe 
to this channel. I do apologize for some of the audio issues in this episode, but when you get out into the elements, you've got to expect the elements, and I will get better at trying to work around these problems, uh, but I hope it's not got in the way of you guys enjoying this episode, and I'll see you next time here on the Underground Paradox, the UGP. Thank you.